Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel today. We are back on the train, which is the roller coaster that we are calling the Duncan v. Bonta lawsuit, which of course is CRPA's challenge to California's ban on magazine oh, that can hold more than 10 rounds. To walk us through it today, we've brought in CRPA's volunteer president, Chuck Michelle. Chuck, thank you very much for being with us today. Always a pleasure, guys. Absolutely. But before we get into it, please be sure and like, share, and subscribe to these videos. It's really helping with the algorithms. We're trying to get this information out to as many people as possible. There is a lot of information pouring in about this on the internet. We want to make sure uh, that we get the correct information out there and shareable. So uh, jumping into this, Chuck, <laughs> we had a video scheduled for last week. Didn't end up putting it out because it would have been out of date you know, right after we posted it. So we thought we would let things calm down a little bit and really get uh, the full story of what's going on here. But if you haven't been paying attention to Duncan v. Bonta, uh, it, it's, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster over the last week. So Chuck, can you take us through uh, post Benitez's decision, which was a favorable one for us, how this lawsuit has gotten to where it is now? Yeah, well, remember, it, we started with Judge Benitez six or so years ago. We won there before Bruin even came down. We won under the Heller case. And remember, Heller is really the the, the, mag, the uh, arms ban case. Bruin is arms in public case. And so we won under Heller. We went up uh, with uh, Judge Benitez in the United States District Court. We went up to a three-judge panel in the Ninth Circuit. We won again there, or that three-judge panel. Then the, the Ninth Circuit took it on banc to an 11 judge panel. We lost seven to four in the three in the on banc panel. We appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court took the case, held it until Bruin came down, then uh, vacated the on banc ruling, seven to four loss, sent it back down to the on banc court, said, reconsider your ruling in light of what we just said in Bruin. The en banc court, rather than ruling on it right there, sent it all the way back down to Judge Benitez in the United States District Court, the trial court, and he let the state put in all kinds of historical evidence and put in whatever they wanted to try and justify this magazine possession ban. And then he just recently came up with his ruling uh, saying that under Bruin, it's unconstitutional as well as under Heller. Uh, so that was a great ruling. Uh, the the state, the attorney's general's office, they, re, they they learned from their mistake last time around. Last time around, they did not ask for a stay of Judge Benitez's injunction in, in Duncan 1. And so while they tried to get an injunction from him, failed, and then tried to get an injunction against his, uh, excuse me, tried to get a stay against his injunction, and then they had to go to the Ninth Circuit to try and get his injunction stayed. So his injunction declares the law unconstitutional and stops the state from enforcing it. Uh, while that went on that first time around, it took about a week. And during that time, his injunction, his injunction was in place. It was not stayed. So magazines could be sold and bought, bought and sold. And about a million of them, we think, were uh, before the Ninth Circuit finally granted a stay of the injunction. This time around, the, the Attorney General's office learned from their mistakes and did not... Uh, they asked for an injunction as part of their motion. So they asked for it immediately. Judge Benitez gave them 10 days to appeal to the Ninth Circuit to get ask the Ninth Circuit to stay his case. Judge Benitez said, I'm only going to stay it for 10 days. The, on, the, the Ninth Circuit then ruled on that stay. And they, and they granted the stay for another 10 days, an administrative stay. Now, the most interesting thing that came out of that was the en banc panel, Typically, when you when you appeal from a district court, it goes through a three judge panel than the en banc panel. But in this case, there are Ninth Circuit rules that allow an en banc panel to take a case back. It's called a comeback case, and when it comes back from the district court, you don't have to go through the ju three judge panel. You can go straight to the en banc court. That's what they decided to do. Now there are a number of different theories about why they tr decided to do that. One of the most prominent ones is they didn't want to send it back to the three judge panel again, because they knew that the three judge panel having declared the law unconstitutional under Heller was certainly going to declare it unconstitutional under Bruin as well. So the, the en banc panel took it back, granted a 10 day administrative stay and ordered us to file 
ordered the, us to file an opposition to the state's request for a permanent stay while the case is, is litigated on appeal. So we filed that on Saturday. We filed our opposition to their request for a permanent stay on Saturday. And the en banc panel will now decide whether or not to grant that permanent stay while the case is appealed. The most interesting part of this was that several of the judges on the en banc panel uh, dissented from the uh, Ninth, the, the rest of the panel's decision to stay Judge Benitez's injunction and and pointed out that, you know, this is not the way it's supposed to work, that uh, uh, the en banc panel should have let it go through the three-judge panel again, and the en banc panel really seemed to be grasping to try and get this case because they were hoping that they could, you know, maybe it was predetermined that, that they would uh, uh, rule against it again. Now that's all uh, internal uh, debate discussion within the Ninth Circuit, uh, and it makes for very interesting reading. Uh, but in the end of the day, we now have a motion pending in front of the uh, en banc panel to permanently stay or to stay the case while it's litigated on appeal that we have opposed. So the en banc panel is going to have to rule on that. And then we will argue, maybe have to do additional briefs, we probably will, for the en banc panel, additional legal briefs for the en banc panel to decide whether or not Judge Benitez in the district court was right or not. The, if there's a silver lining to this, it's that the jumping past the three judge panel saves us probably uh, a year or two in litigating in front of that panel because it we skipped that step. So we'll go straight to the en banc panel, which is where we probably would have wound up anyway. Uh, and now Dunk, the Duncan case is one of the cases at the front of the line for the Supreme Court to, to hear it. And these dissents, and there will certainly be dissents from the en banc panel. Uh, remember, it was seven to four that we lost before. So we need to pick up two votes. The Bruin decision needs to convince two judges on the en banc panel that this is unconstitutional, then we win six to five. So, uh, but regardless of what happens, it's, it's very likely that the Supreme Court will be will be taking this case. They'll be at least be looking very carefully at it. They they the dissents basically tell the Supreme Court, those judges that are dissenting tell the Supreme Court you should take this case because the en banc panel is playing games. Well, so you you did touch on a couple of things that I wanted to focus on, and I guess I'll hit this one first. Is the silver lining? So, you know, the first time around, we did go from the, the federal district court to the three judge panel to the en banc panel to the Supreme Court. Uh, I, you know, we've there's been discussion that it's highly unlikely either side's going to back down on this. So, with the assumption that it will continue to go up, that silver lining is that we don't have to take the time to do that with the three judge panel, go straight to the en banc panel. That does that does save the lawsuit some time. But can let's talk about irregularity for a second because you know, this is. The, the dissenting opinions, especially the one from Van Dyke, um, you know, on on the on banc panel, uh, I started looking it up and, you know, of fifteen hundred on average appeals to an on banc panel uh, in the Ninth Circuit in general, looks like they uh, normally take between twenty five and fifty on banc and, and rule in opinions every year. That seems like a low number for the amount of cases that's going through the Ninth Circuit in general are on banc opinions across the nation something that happens regularly because we do seem to have a lot of second amendment litigation that in the ninth circuit ends up getting appealed and it goes to an on banc well not just the ninth circuit a lot of second amendment on banc panels review is rare statistically speaking but it's not rare in second amendment cases especially in the second circuit in the, in the ninth circuit but in other cases across the country the second amendment cases are uh going in front of on banc panels more often uh, than another type of case would. And that's because it's a new area, relatively new area of constitutional law. And so the larger court wants to get involved and make sure that the, that a three judge panel doesn't do something that the larger court doesn't like. Now, <laughs> that might be they don't like it because the three judge panel says that the Second Amendment prohibits what state, whatever state law they're trying to, the, the state is trying to protect. But at the end of the day, uh, it's not unusual for a, const a new constitutional question to be reviewed by en banc court, despite the fact that they are statistically rare. It's rare for an en banc court to take a case. 
that the en banc court, what's going to have to happen now, these en banc courts are going to have to, to decide what the appropriate methodology is in a Second Amendment case under Bruin, whether it's magazines or there's the Hawaii case on butterfly knives where we just got a three-judge panel that struck down the Hawaii butterfly knife law, and they got the methodology right. Hawaii has asked the, the Ninth Circuit to take that case, the Tedder case, the butterfly knife case, en banc. We'll see what they do there. But the, the, what has to be resolved is this methodology. What, what is the, how do you apply the test of Bruin to determine whether or not a gun law is constitutional or not? It's supposed to be very simple. You ask whether or not the conduct that's being regulated is covered by the text of the Second Amendment, and that's the right to keep, which is possess, and the right to bear, which is carry arms, not just firearms. In Katano, it was a stun gun case. Uh, so, and if it is, and most almost always it's going to be because all arms are covered, but not just arms. Uh, well, not all arms, dangerous and unusual arms may not be covered, but uh, uh, almost all arms will be. And then if they are, uh, you move to the second step and that's where the test comes in. And this is where, <laughs> give me, my cat just jumped on me. Uh, this is where, the uh, court has to look to see whether or not there is a historical analog, a historical law that's similar enough to the modern day law to, to indicate that the founding fathers would have tolerated the modern day law because they tolerated the historical law. So those historical analogs is what the uh, courts have to look to to see whether or not the founding fathers would have tolerated a modern day law. And there are, and this is where the common use test comes in. There are no historical laws that ban a classification of firearms that were commonly possessed and used for lawful purposes. There aren't any. So any case that's a gun ban, like Heller was the handgun ban, uh, uh, or I should say an arms ban, uh, Duncan, which is a magazine ban, uh, you know, uh, unsafe, so-called unsafe handguns, the whole roster case, all of those are questions of uh Guns that are handguns, in the case of the roster, that are in common use for lawful purposes. Now, if a gun is, or a particular arm is dangerous and, not or, and unusual, like maybe a pistol, a pocket pistol, or a cane gun, or something like that, uh, that could be regulated. And historically, some of those types of products were regulated, those types of arms were regulated. And also, there's plenty of regulation on the manner and where you can take a gun, not banning something as a sensitive place, but maybe saying, you know, you can't take a gun into this saloon you know, on Friday night, uh, but ne but never as broad as some of the things that California is, has done and is doing. So you, I mean, so you got the silver lining. It, so I'm looking at these dissenting opinions from a couple of the judges that were originally on the en banc panel for Duncan. Uh, is there, when you when you look at this complaint as a whole, is it procedural? Is it just them saying, what the heck are you guys doing? This is unprecedented. You you shouldn't be doing this. Or uh, is there any potential for this decision or move uh, to be negative toward the 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 advocacy of this case in general? Maybe we're. I mean, so far it's been procedural. They extended the stay administratively. Now they have to decide substantively whether or not to extend the stay while the appeal gets litigated in an en banc panel. And then the en banc panel is going to have to make a substantive ruling on whether or not the Second Amendment prohibits banning magazines that are commonly possessed, not dangerous and unusual, by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. And so that's the substantive aspect. And that's where, if they get the methodology right, they will strike down the law. If they get the methodology wrong, and there is some suspicion among some of the judges on the, on the Ninth Circuit, that they're going to try and get it wrong because they don't want to strike this law down, uh, then that that's where you get into this, you know, the, the bias or politics of uh, potentially some of the judges. But I don't think the Supreme Court is going to let them get away with that. And like I said, we only need to change two minds on the on bond panel as a result of the Bruin decision. You know, if they're if they apply it faithfully and read it read it thoroughly, uh, I don't see how they 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 uphold this law, but they'll, they could find a way. Don't get me wrong. They're smarter than I am. Uh, but then, the, but then the Supreme court's going to have to get involved. 
Well, let's talk about how they might do that really quick. Let's take a, a little bit of a dive into the, the 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 decision that Benitez came out with in general. Uh, is it going to be more? I mean, you read the decision uh, or the opinion. It's it's what seventy one or seventy three pages. Um, a lot of the arguments in there, uh, as I was reading it, I found to be similar to what uh, the original arguments were. Obviously, we're looking through the the lens of Bruin. Uh, looking through that different lens in the Ninth Circuit, uh, expectations don't always meet reality. Do, is there a certain expectation that judges who may have, you know, deemed the law constitutional originally would swap with that new lens of Bruin? Well, I think they're they're going to have to ask a different question. They're going to have to do, before they were applying like this balancing test, interest balancing test. They're saying basically the public safety outweighs the individual right. They can't do that anymore. They're going to have to ask a new question, and that is whether or not there's a historical law that justifies the modern day law or some other exception. Are magazines dangerous and unusual? But what the state's trying to do is saying magazines aren't arms at all. They're not part of the Second Amendment. They're not covered by the text because they're not arms. Well, but the Second Amendment doesn't just cover self-defense arms. It covers, and nothing in Bruin or, or Heller said it, or even implied that it does. They're just trying to read it that way. But the Second Amendment's going to cover range activities, gunsmithing, uh, uh, marksmanship, you know, training, uh, hunting. All the guns that are used for all those different types of purposes are contemplated as covered by the Second Amendment. Uh, there's no restriction that says you can only possess an arm for self-defense. Uh, but that's what they're trying to argue. And then they're saying that the only arms that are covered are those in common use for self-defense. Then they tried to argue that use means pulling the trigger as opposed to having it in your, you know, quick access, open in the dark uh, lockbox next to your bed. Uh, uh, because that's being used, that's a deterrent value just sitting there. And it's being used for self-defense, even though the, the emergency hasn't arisen yet, you don't have to actually take it out. But those arms, the very, very fact that millions of Americans have those arms in, in their home for self-defense is a deterrent to crime because criminals don't, don't want to break into a house where they might get shot. So it's being used even though it's not being, even though the trigger's not being pulled. But that's an example of the kind of distortions that the state resorts to to try and twist Bruin so that they can try and convince a court that might be pre-inclined to rule in their favor to hold a gun law, a gun ban law is constitutional. Well, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you don't think that the, the Supreme Court would let the Ninth Circuit get away with that. Uh, what is the outlook based on a comment like that? Do you see the Ninth Circuit coming out and saying, hey, this law is constitutional, it gets appealed to the Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court remands it back and says, you got it wrong, fix it, or just... No, not this time around. They will address it directly, I think. I mean, unless something strange happens between now and then. The Supreme Court, if the Ninth Circuit en banc panel gets the methodology wrong, I don't think there's going to be another, you know, Bruin-type case. I don't think Rahimi is the type of case. And, and that's that's going to be decided, I think, before Duncan gets there. Although maybe not. Uh, uh, we might be sitting back in the Ninth Circuit, in the Supreme Court again, asking for them to review the case. They might decide Rahimi. They might clarify the methodology in the Rahimi. And they might vacate the, ninth, the en banc panel again and remand it again. It's conceivable. But I think that the Supreme Court has lost patience. They, they saw the courts distort the Heller ruling for 12 years. And there is now probably five, probably six, at least probably five justices on the Supreme Court who do not want to let this fester anymore like it did after Heller. So I think they're going to take it and they're going to straighten things out. Well, if you can't put a price on happiness, you certainly can't put a time schedule on the court system. But I have to ask, as I always do, what kind of outlook do you have here? Do you see this moving through the en banc panel quickly? Um, or, or is this something that could get drawn out? Yes, the Supreme Court has telegraphed to the lower courts that they want them to process these things quickly. Otherwise, they're going to be considering emergency, emergency stays or emergency injunctions from the Supreme Court while they're litigated below. So I think the Ninth Circuit is going to try and get this done pretty quickly. Uh, you know, people have asked me for this, and I'm not going to say two weeks because everything is... <laughs> 
But but I'd say uh, the under over is probably two to six months. Well, we're certainly going to keep an eye on it, Chuck. Any any final thoughts on on this case as it continues to move? Well, it, just keep in mind nationally, you know, the CRPA is involved in sensitive places cases, magazine cases, uh, semi-auto ban cases all across the country because we have to be because this methodology is ultimately going to be either resolved at the circuit level the way we want it to be, or the Supreme Court's going to have to weigh in, whether it's in the Ninth Circuit or a Seventh Circuit or the Second Circuit, whatever court they're going to get involved. Uh, and so this methodology is the key question because everything, whether it's a magazine or a butterfly knife or a stun gun, all of those uh, bands are going to be tested by the same methodology. And if we get the methodology from Bruin uh, that we think we, we deserve from Bruin, uh, a lot of these California extremist gun ban laws, gun control laws, are going to be struck down. And that's, you know, they've never made us any safer, uh, despite the, the Cook statistics that the politicians love to put out there to try and claim that they are. But this is a battle royale between uh, ultra-progressive forces being spoon-fed briefs from the uh, uh, Bloom Bloomberg Group Every Town Law. Uh, they're writing a lot of these briefs. They're giving them the talking points. They're telling them what laws to pass. They're telling them how to write the laws to try and get around Bruin. And it, you know, so it's a it's a you know it's a scorched earth fight to for us to save the Second Amendment and for them to try and uh, destroy it and destroy the gun culture, the freedom loving gun culture that respects the right, the individual right to protect yourself and your family and not be dependent on government. Uh, it's that that's the battle of the of the philosophies, you know, uh, and and so this Second Amendment is the tip of a spear of the spear on a larger fight for like how our society is, society is going to be governed. Are are we going to uh, be individuals and responsible for ourselves and have the right to make choices and uh, not be demonized for owning a gun or for saying the wrong thing, something politically incorrect, or be banned? I mean, this is part of the Newsom's war on gun culture, he wants to pass the 28th Amendment to knock the Second Amendment out. And then he wants to launch this culture war. And it's he he wants he's trying to murder the gun culture. It's culture side. He wants to demonize gun owners, stigmatize gun ownership, ban any kind of uh, exposure to the shooting sports that, that there might be for, for uh, youth. Uh, because he, in a generation or so, he doesn't want people to, you know, certainly no large numbers of people to own guns. It's not really a secret. So uh, that's why, you know, it's also an open secret in the halls of the Capitol that they're trying to overwhelm us. That's why there were 100 gun bills introduced at the beginning of the session, and almost two dozen of them were signed by Newsom, uh, including SB2 and AB28, which CRPA has also filed a lawsuit challenging SB2, the Sensitive Places Expansion Law. Uh, just last week. So we're fighting, we're on the forefront fighting all of these things for Californians, but also keeping our finger in the, uh, 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 ki the, the fights going on in other states because all of these states, again, the methodology, if it's adopted in one state, it might get adopted then in, a, in one circuit, it might get adopted in another circuit, and we have to stop it uh, before it catches on. Well, we've certainly seen uh, a lot of good results uh, uh, as a consequence of the Bruin decision so far. I think this would be a huge shred of evidence if we have an en banc panel who we know uh, already decided once under a different per, uh, under a different lens uh, that this uh, magazine ban was constitutional. If we if we could get that flipped, that would be huge evidence that the Bruin test is working. Uh, Chuck, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. We're definitely going to keep an eye on it and keep in touch as it goes on. Thank you again. Hey, don't forget, I, I, I am predicting that this Friday we're going to get another decision from Judge Benitez, either on semi-autos or billy clubs or... Uh, probably not the roadie case, not the ammo background check case yet, because we're just submitting our final brief on that case today. But I do think we're going to see another ruling from him. Uh, you know, uh, my uh, cosmic connection tells me uh, on Friday. So we'll talk again soon, I expect. Well, yeah, we are certainly going to have to heed those cosmic connections. And if that is the case, we're certainly going to have you on soon again. Thank you very much, Chuck, for being with us.
And if you like these videos and content like this, it is helping. Please be sure and drop a like, a comment, and share these videos. We want to make sure that everyone going to the ballot box in 2024 is armed with this information so that they can make the Second Amendment a priority. Obviously, the supermajority in Sacramento is hurting us right now, but we can change that this coming election. So please, like I said, drop a like, share, uh, or, or comment on the videos. And thanks again, guys. We'll see you on the next one.